Hi friends and welcome back to Book Club with Ms. Dub. Today we're going to be reading chapter 19 from To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Please be advised that some viewers may find the content of these chapters to be rather disturbing or feel uncomfortable. So you have been warned and this is a book for older readers. Um, so please take that as you will and let's go ahead and start with chapter 19. Thomas, Thomas Robinson reached around, ran his fingers under his left arm and lifted it. He guided his arm to the Bible and his rubber-like left hand sought contact with the black binding. As he raised his right hand, the useless one slipped off the Bible and hit the clerk's table. He was trying again when Judge Taylor growled, that'll do, Tom. Tom took the oath and stepped into the witness chair. Atticus very quickly in induced him to tell us. Tom was 25 years of age. He was married with three children. He had been in trouble with the law before. He once received 30 days for disorderly conduct. It must have been disorderly, said Atticus. What did it consist of? Got in a fight with another man. He tried to cut me. Did he succeed? Yes, sir. A little. Not enough to hurt. You see, I had Tom moved his left shoulder. Yes, said Atticus. You were both convicted? Yes, sir. I had to serve because I couldn't pay the fine. Other fella paid his'n. Dill leaned across me and asked Jim what Atticus was doing. Jim said Atticus was showing the jury that Tom had nothing to hide. Were you acquainted with Mayella Violet Yule? asked Atticus. Yes, sir. I had to pass her place going to and fro, to and from the field every day. Whose field? I picks from Mr. Link D's. Were you picking cotton in November? No, sir. I works in the fall and I works in his yard fall and winter time. I works pretty steady for him all year round. He's got a lot of pecan trees and things. You say you had to pass the Yule place to get to and from work. Is there any other way to go? No, sir. None's I know of. Tom, did she ever speak to you? Why, yes, sir. I'd tip my hat when I'd go by, and one day she asked me to come inside the fence and bust up a chiffre robe for her. When did she ask you the, to chop up the, the chiffre robe? Mr. Finch, it was way last spring. I remember it because it was chopping time and I had my hoe with me. I said I didn't have nothing but this hoe, and she said she had a hatchet. She give me the hatchet and I broke up the chiffre robe. She said, I reckon I'll have to give you a nickel, won't I? I said, no ma'am, there ain't no charge. Then I went home. Mr. Finch, that was way last spring, way over a year ago. Did you ever go to this place again? Yes, sir. When? Well, I went lots of times. Judge Taylor instinctively reached for his gavel, but let his hand fall. The murmur below us died without his help. Under what circumstances? Please, sir. Why did you go inside the fence lots of times? Tom Robinson's forehead relaxed. She'd call me in, sir. Seemed like every time I passed by yonder, she'd have some little something for me to do. Chopping kindling, toting water for her. She watered them red flowers every day. Were you paid for your services? No, sir. Not after she offered me a nickel the first time. I was glad to do it, Mr. Yule. Didn't seem to help her none, and neither did the chillin'. And I knowed she didn't have no nickels to spare. Where were the other children? They was always around, all over the place. They'd watch me work, some of them. Some of them had sat in the window. Would Miss Mayella talk to you? Yes, sir, she talked to me. As Tom Robinson gave his testimony, it came to me that Mayella Ewell must have been the loneliest person in the world. She was even lonelier than Boo Radley, who had not been out of the house in 25 years. When Atticus asked had she any friends, she seemed not to know what he meant. Then she thought he was making fun of her. She was as sad, I thought, as what Jim called a mixed child. White people wouldn't have anything to do with her because she lived among pigs. Negroes wouldn't have anything to do with her because she was white. 
She couldn't live like Mr. Dolphus Raymond, who preferred the company of Negroes, because she didn't own a riverbank and she wasn't from a fine old family. Nobody said, that's just their way, about the Yules. Makem gave them Christmas baskets, welfare money, and the back of its hand. Tom Robinson was probably the only person who was ever decent to her. But she said he took advantage of her, and when she stood up, she looked at him as if he were dirt beneath her feet. Did you ever, Atticus interrupted my meditations, at any time go on the Yule property did you ever set foot on the Yule property without an express invitation from one of them? No, sir, Mr. Finch, I never did that. I would never do that, sir. Atticus sometimes said that one way to tell whether a witness was lying or telling the truth was to listen rather than watch. I applied this test. Tom denied it three times in one breath, but quietly, with no hint of whining in his voice, and I found myself believing him in spite of his protesting too much. He seemed to be a respectable Negro, and a respectable Negro would never go up into somebody's yard of his own volition. Tom, what happened to you on the evening of November 21st of last year? Below us, the spectators drew a collective breath and leaned forward. Behind us, the Negroes did the same. Tom was a black velvet Negro, not shiny, but soft black velvet. The whites of his eyes shone in his face, and when he spoke, we saw flashes of his teeth. If he had been whole, he would have been a fine specimen of a man. Mr. Finch, he said, I was going home as usual that evening, and when I passed the Yule place, Miss Mayella were on the porch like she said she were. It seemed real quiet like, and I didn't quite know why. I was studying why just passing by when she says for me to come there and help her a minute. Well, I went inside the fence and looked around for some kindling to work on, but I didn't see none. And she says, nah, I got something for you to do in the house. The old door's off its hinges and falls coming and on pretty fast. I said, you got a screwdriver, Miss Mayella? She said, she show had. Well, I went up the steps and she motioned me to come inside and I went in the front room and looked at the door. I said, Miss Mayella, this door looks all right. I pulled it back and forth and those hinges were all right. Then she shut the door in my face. Mr. Finch, I was wondering why it was so quiet, like, and it come to me that there weren't a child on the place, not one of them. And I said, Miss Mayella, Where's the chillin'? Tom's black velvet skin had begun to shine and he ran his hand over his face. I say, where's the chillin', he continue. And she says, she was laughing sorta. She says they all gone to town to get ice creams. She says, took me a slap year to save em nickels, but I done it. They all gone to town. Tom's discomfort was not from the humidity what did you say then, Tom? asked Atticus. I said something like, why, Miss Mayella, that's right smart of you to treat em. And she said, you think so? I don't think she understood what I was thinking. I meant it was smart of her to save like that and nice of her to treat em. I understand you, Tom. Go on, said Atticus. Well, I said I'd best be going. I couldn't do nothing for her. And she says, oh, yes, I could. And I asked her what, and she says to just step on that chair yonder and get that box down from the top of the chiffer robe. Not the same chiffer robe you busted up, asked Atticus. The witness smiled. Nasa, another one. Most as tall as the room. So I done what she told me, and I was just reaching, when the next thing I know, she, she grabbed me round the legs, grabbed me, grabbed me round the legs, Mr. Finch. She scared me so bad I hopped down and turned the chair over. That was the only thing, only furniture stirred in that room, Mr. Finch, when I left it, I swear for God. What happened after you turned the chair over? Tom Robinson had come to a dead stop. He glanced at Atticus, then at the jury, and then at Mr. Underwood sitting across the room. Tom, you're sworn to tell the truth. Will you tell it? 
Tom ran his hand nervously over his mouth. What happened after that? Answer the question, said Judge Taylor. One third of his cigar had vanished. Mr. Finch, I got down off of that chair and turned around and she sort of jumped on me. Jumped on you? Violently? No, sir, she, she hugged me. She hugged me round the waist. This time, Judge Taylor's gavel came down with a bang. And as it did, the overhead lights went on in the courtroom. Darkness had not come, but the afternoon sun had left the windows. Judge Taylor quickly restored order. Then what did she do? The witness swallowed hard. She reached up and kissed me, side of the face. She says she's never kissed a grown man before, and she might as well kiss a inward. She said what her papa do to her don't count. She says, kiss me back, inward. I say, Miss Mayella, let me out of here, and tried to run, but she got her back to the door, and I'd have had to push her. I didn't want to harm her, Mr. Finch, and, and I say, let me pass. But just when I say it, Mr. Yule yonder hollowed, hollered through the window. What did he say? Tom Robinson swallowed again and his eyes widened. Something not fitting to say, not fitting for these folks and chilling to hear. What did he say, Tom? You must tell the jury what he said. Tom Robinson shut his eyes tight. He says, you GD whore, I'll kill you. Then what happened? Mr. Finch, I was running so fast, I didn't know what happened. Tom, did you rape Mayella Yule? I did not, sir. Did you harm her in any way? I did not, sir. Did you resist her advances? Mr. Finch, I tried. I tried to, without being ugly to her. I didn't want to be ugly. I didn't want to push her or nothing. It occurred to me that in their own way, Tom Robinson's manners were as good as Atticus's. Until my father explained it to me later, I did not understand the subtlety of Tom's predicament. He would not have dared strike a white woman under any circumstances and expect to live long, so he took the first opportunity to run, a sure sign of guilt. Tom, go back once more to Mr. Yule, said Atticus. Did he say anything to you? Not anything, sir. He might have said something, but I weren't there. That'll do, Atticus cut in sharply. What you did hear, who was he talking to? Mr. Finch, he were talking and looking at Miss Mayella. Then you ran? I sure did, sir. Why did you run? I was scared, sir. Why were you scared? Mr. Finch, if you was an N-word like me, you'd be scared too. Atticus sat down. Mr. Gilmer was making his way to the witness stand, but before he got there, Mr. Link Dees rose from the audience and announced, I just want the whole lot of you to know one thing right now. That boy's worked for me eight years and I ain't had a speck of trouble out of him, not a speck. Shut your mouth, sir, Judge Taylor was wide awake and roaring. He was also pink in the face. His speech was miraculously unimpaired by his cigar. Link D's, he yelled. If you have anything you want to say, you can say it under oath and at the proper time. But until then, you get out of this room. Do you hear me? Get out of this room, sir. You hear me? I'll be damned if I listen to this case again. Judge Taylor looked daggers at Atticus as if daring him to speak. But Atticus had ducked his head and was laughing into his lap. I remembered something he had said about Judge Taylor's ex-cathedral remarks, sometimes exceeding his duty, but that few lawyers ever did anything about them. I looked at Jim, but Jim shook his head. It ain't like one of the jurymen got up and started talking, he said. I think it'd be different then. Mr. Link was just disturbing the peace or something. Judge Taylor told the reporter to expunge anything he happened to have written down after Miss Mr. Finch, if you were an N-word like me, you'd be scared too, and told the jury to disregard the interruption. He looked suspiciously down the middle aisle and waited, I suppose for Mr. Link Dees to effect total departure. Then he said, go ahead, Mr. Gilmer. You were given 30 days once for disorderly conduct, Robinson, said Mr. Gilmer. Yes, sir. 
What did the N-word look like when you got through with him? He beat me, Mr. Gilmer. Yes, but you were convicted, weren't you? Atticus raised his head. It was a misdemeanor and it's in the record, Judge. I thought he sounded tired. Witness will answer though, said Judge Taylor, just as wearily. Yes, sir, I got 30 days. I knew that Mr. Gilmer would sincerely tell the jury that anyone who was convicted of disorderly conduct could easily have had it in his heart to take advantage of Mayella Ewell, and that was the only reason he cared. Reasons like that helped. Robinson, you're pretty good at busting up shiffer robes and kindling with one hand, aren't you? Yes, sir, I reckon so. Strong enough to choke the breath out of a woman and sling her to the floor? I never done that, sir. But are you strong enough to? I reckon so, sir. Had your eye on her a long time, hadn't you, boy? No, sir, I never looked at her. Then you were mighty polite to do all that chopping and hauling for her, weren't you, boy? I was just trying to help her out, sir. That was mighty generous of you. You had chores at home after your regular work, didn't you? Yes, sir. Why didn't you do them instead of Miss Yule's? I done them both, sir. You must have been pretty busy. Why? Why what, sir? Why were you so anxious to do that woman's chores? Tom Robinson hesitated, searching for an answer. Looked like she didn't have anybody to help her, like I says. With Mr. Yule and seven children on the place, boy? Well, I says it looked like they never help her none. You did all this chopping and work from sheer goodness, boy? Tried to help her, I says. Mr. Gilmer smiled grimly at the jury. You're a mighty good fellow, it seems. Did all this for not one penny. Yes, sir. I felt right sorry for her. She seemed to try more than the rest of them. You felt sorry for her? You felt sorry for her? Mr. Gilmer seemed ready to rise to the ceiling. The witness realized his mistake and shifted uncomfortably in the chair, but the damage was done. Below us, nobody liked Tom Robinson's answer. Mr. Gilmer paused a long time to let it sink in. Now you went by the house as usual last November 21st, he said, and she asked you to come in and bust up a chiffre robe? No, sir. Do you deny that you went by the house? No, sir. She said she had something for me to do inside the house. She says she asked you to bust up a chiffre robe. Is that right? No, sir, it ain't. Then you say she's lying, boy? Atticus was on his feet, but Tom Robinson didn't need him. I don't say she's lying, Mr. Gilmer. I say she's mistaken in her mind. To the next 10 questions, as Mr. Gilmer reviewed Mayella's version of the events, the witness's steady answer was that she was mistaken in her mind. Didn't Mr. Yule run you off the place, boy? No, sir, I don't think he did. Don't think, what do you mean? I mean, I didn't stay long enough for him to run me off. You're very candid about this. Why did you run so fast? I says I was scared, sir. If you had a clear conscience, why were you scared? Like I says before, it weren't safe for any inward to be in a fix like that. But you weren't in a fix. You testified that you were resisting Miss Yule. Were you so scared that she'd hurt you? You ran a big buck like you. No, sir, I'd scared I'd be in court just like I am now. Scared of arrest? Scared you'd have to face up to what you did? No, sir. Scared I'd have to face up to what I didn't do. Are you being imprudent to me, boy? No, sir. I didn't go to be. This was as much as I heard of Mr. Gilmer's cross-examination because Jim made me take Dill out. For some reason, Dill had started crying and couldn't stop quietly at first. Then his sobs were heard by several people in the balcony. Jim said if I didn't go with him, he'd make me, and Reverend Sykes said I'd better go, so I went. Dill had seemed to be all right all day, nothing wrong with him, but I guess he hadn't fully recovered from running away. Ain't you feeling good? I asked when we reached the bottom of the stairs. Dill tried to pull himself together as we ran down the south steps. Mr. Link Dees was a lonely figure on the top step. Anything happened in Scout? He asked as we went by. No, sir, I answered over my shoulder. Dill here, he's sick. Come on out under the trees, I, I said. 
Heat got you, I expect. We chose the fattest live oak and we sat down under it. It was just him I couldn't stand, Dill said. Who, Tom? That old Mr. Gilmer doing him that way, talking so hateful to him. Dill, that's his job. Why, if we didn't have prosecutors, well, we couldn't have defense attorneys, I reckon. Dill exhaled patiently. I know all that, Scout. It was the way he said it, it made me sick, plain sick. He's supposed to act that way, Dill. He was cross. He didn't act that way when... Dill, those were his own witnesses. Well, Mr. Finch didn't act that way to Mayella and old man Yule when he cross-examined him. The way that man called him boy all the time and sneered at him and looked around at the jury every time he answered. Well, Dill, after all, he's just a Negro. I don't care one speck. It ain't right. Somehow it ain't right to do him that way. Hasn't anybody got any business talking like that? It just makes me sick. That's just Mr. Gilmer's way, Dill. He does them all that way. You've never seen him get good and down on one yet. Why, when, why, when, well, today, Mr. Gilmer seemed to me like he wasn't half trying. They do him all that way, most lawyers, I mean. Mr. Finch doesn't. Well, he's not an example, Dill. He's, I was trying to grope in my memory for a sharp phrase of Miss Maudie Atkinson's. I had it. He's in the same, he's the same in the courtroom as he is in the public streets. Well, that's not what I mean, said Dill. I know what you mean, boy, said a voice behind us. We thought it came from the tree trunk, but it belonged to Mr. Dolphus Raymond. He peered around the trunk at us. You aren't thin-hided. It just makes you sick, doesn't it? And that's the end of chapter 19. All right, we will continue on soon. I hope you're enjoying it. This is such a good book, and it gives us so much to think about, and it is still so relevant. Um, it's really amazing. And as a reminder, this is one of the most challenged books that has been tried to people have tried to take this out of libraries and schools. And so it is so important for us to um, to read, to be rebellious readers and to really read the hard things and think about um, how life was and how people are and how we can be better. So um, I know there are some controversial things in here and it just gives you a lot to think about. And I think that reading can do a lot to make us think deeply about ourselves and about the world and about others and really help us to grow as humans. So I am so glad that I get to share this with you. I hope that you are enjoying this. Um, I can't wait to keep going with you. And um, I think we're gonna do um, like a rebellious reader series where we read a lot of challenging, a, a lot of books that have been challenged or banned. So stick with me and don't forget to subscribe, please. I know I keep saying that, but I wanna grow this channel so bad. Okay, so I love you guys. You guys are amazing. and. Um, like I always say, I can't wait to read again with you soon. Bye now.